I'm going to go ahead and go live. And we're live. So thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Wendy Kovich, the president of the League of Women Voters of the Elgin area. And um, just a little about the League. The League of Women Voters is a community-based grassroots organization. And we fought since 1920 to improve our government and engage all citizens in the decisions that impact all of our lives. The Elgin Area League includes people from Bartlett, Carpentersville, East Dundee, Elgin, Gilberts, Sleepy Hollow, South Elgin, and West Dundee. And tonight we're going to learn about the District of Columbia and why it should become a state. So please join me in welcoming Ann Anderson, who is the chair of the Committee for Full Rights for DC Citizens from the League of Women Voters of the District of Columbia. Anne, please tell us about yourself. Well, I am delighted to be here. Thank you very much for your invitation. This is just really nice to get out Zoom wise and talk to people who's, who are not living in DC. I've actually been living in DC since 1964. And uh, in fact, I spent the summer of 63 in DC. Um, so I was able to attend the March on Washington and so I heard MLK's I Have a Dream speech uh, in person. Um, so in 1964 was the first time that DC citizens were able to vote for president since DC's founding. And I saw the birth of a new democracy then as people came out of the polls saying, I voted. So I've been working on DC statehood issues since 1971 and this experience of this recent uh, momentum is just amazing and helpful. So that's where I am and I'm looking forward to talking with you about where we stand now. Well, great. And um, thanks so much for being here. And you brought us a video to share. I did. Um, do you want me to say a little something about it? Sure. To begin with, okay. Well, the video that I'm sharing uh, is uh, called Statehood Stories Insurrection, and it's about January 6th. And I thought it was really important to explain, you know, what DC's role in it was. So that's what this is about. So you want to roll the video? Yes, I will go ahead and do that. The lack of DC statehood impacts many areas, not the least of which is ensuring law and order. The reason in- And of course that's not working, is it? <laughs> I'm gonna try this again. Okay. All right. The lack of DC statehood impacts many areas, not the least of which is ensuring law and order. The recent insurrection at the Capitol building on January 6th demonstrates this well. The nation witnessed the chaos as the rioters overwhelmed the Capitol security forces. Many wondered where the reinforcements were. What caused the delay of reinforcements at the Capitol is still under investigation with multiple entities asking serious questions. This presentation does not pretend to answer any of those questions. They need to be left to those in charge of the investigations. The intention of the DC League of Women Voters is to provide clear information about how things are set up to work under the current arrangements in Washington, DC. We will also outline how things would work differently if the residential and commercial parts of DC were admitted as a state. Before outlining the course of events on that day, it's worth stepping back and looking at the complexities of our current setup. Within the District of Columbia, law enforcement is not the job of a single entity as might be expected in other jurisdictions. 
DC has many different law enforcement agencies, all of whom have a role to play. This includes the DC Metropolitan Police Department, or MPD. The MPD is a department of the local home rule government of the District of Columbia. It is paid for by the taxpayers who live in DC. Other local law enforcement agencies include the Metro Transit Police, which covers the rail and bus systems in DC and parts of Maryland and Virginia. There is the US Park Police, who have jurisdiction over our National Mall and the monuments. And of course, the US Capitol Police, charged specifically with protecting the Capitol and members of Congress within the Capitol building. On top of that, DC is geographically adjacent to cities in Maryland and Virginia, each with their own jurisdictions and enforcement agencies. All of these agencies have detailed agreements on how to coordinate with each other with the understanding that rapid response is paramount. And if extra help is needed, the US National Guard stands ready to get involved throughout the US, including a unit specifically in DC. This brings us to recent events. On January 6, 2021, insurrectionists stormed the US Capitol, rejecting the results of the presidential election and resulting in the deaths of five people, including one member of the Capitol Police. The DC Metropolitan Police were the first to respond to the scene under a standing agreement between the Capitol Police and DC Police. DC Mayor Muriel Bowser did not have the authority to immediately call the local National Guard, as would any governor in the US, she had already requested 300 DC National Guard members to help with traffic control in anticipation of the usual traffic snarls when there are sizable crowds at demonstrations in DC. They were not armed, nor was their mission to respond to rioting demonstrators. They were supposed to free DC MPD to provide whatever policing was required. It is worth noting that the DC National Guard, as opposed to units in other states, is uniquely controlled by the federal government and their deployment requires authorization from the Department of Defense. So Mayor Bowser could not alter the mission of the original contingent of the DC National Guard without permission from the Department of Defense. Nor could she call up additional DC National Guard without authorization from the DOD. Mayor Bowser's initial request to deploy the DC National Guard to support the Capitol Police were denied by the Department of Defense. The governors of neighboring Maryland and Virginia also called up their guard in response to the emergency at the Capitol. However, since all of DC is a federal district, their National Guards could not cross the district line without being authorized by the federal government. Requests from Governor Hogan of Maryland to send the Maryland National Guard into the Federal District of Columbia were repeatedly denied. Governor Hogan's request was reportedly approved over 90 minutes after the initial denial, along with Mayor Bowser's request and requests from New York Governor Cuomo and Virginia Governor Northam to send their National Guards into the Federal District of Columbia. Mayor Bowser had called for the DC Guard before 2 p.m. on January 6th, but they did not arrive at the Capitol until after 5 p.m. If DC were a state, as governor, she would have been able to mobilize them immediately. And while the National Guard would still have needed permission to move on to federal lands around the Capitol, there would have been much less delay. She also could have requested help from neighboring states, governor to governor, the way that it works among the 50 states in situations of natural disasters like wildfires and hurricanes. So even if the delays in moving on to federal grounds that are being investigated had occurred, it certainly seems likely that if DC had been a state on January 6th, 
the Capitol grounds would have been surrounded by National Guard forces well before 5 p.m. Such a show of force would certainly have changed the dynamics of the situation. Finally, it is worth noting that it was the DC Metropolitan Police Department and eventually the DC National Guard that first provided the backup requested by the US Capitol Police to support and protect democracy. The citizens of Washington DC where 700,000 plus people live stepped forward to protect our nation's capital and government, even though they are not represented in Congress, a body that controls their laws and budget. The League of Women Voters of the District of Columbia, along with other advocates, believe that DC statehood is a logical response to many of the challenges that confront our citizens. Bills have been introduced in the 117th Congress, which would grant DC statehood. We are closer now than we have ever been to fixing this hole in our democracy. The League of Women Voters has always fought for equality in our citizen-led democracy, and we believe that ensuring equal rights under the law for all citizens is an important step in making our democracy stronger and more inclusive. For more information on how you can get involved, please follow the links below. And thank you for your interest. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm curious about whether people have comments or questions right now um, for, about this, because what I'm thinking is that we could um, deal with anything that's right immediately about this um, video, and then I can share my screen and we can talk about um, DC statehood in general and everybody get on the same page, so. Lois, it looks like you had a question. Well, I would like to know what we can do here in Illinois that would help um, move this forward. I know that my congressman um, is in favor of it and I'm pretty sure our two state senators are as well. Um, but it seems to me that it, it, to get it through the Senate is going to be really hard. Well, I think uh, it's really true um, that um, we are. And just to bring you very much up to date, this morning um, I was co-hosting a watch party for, uh, for us while the Oversight Committee of the House passed the bill out to the House floor, and it's gonna be voted on next week on the House floor. Uh, so, and all indications are that it will pass the House again, uh, like it did last year. And then it goes to the Senate, and that's a real question. I think the critical issue in terms of um, helping us get through here is to, in fact, help people understand what is going on? Well, I mean, what? Because there's a way that people don't really get it because, you know, you might get frustrated with your local government, but you got somebody to call. And when you don't have anybody to call, it's really, I mean, we are sidelined and um, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation. So um, there are plenty of things that we can do and in fact, I can show you one of the things that we've been doing. This is a postcard mailer. You can see help, some of us are still waiting for the vote. Basically what it is, is it's two postcards put together and uh, people can write to, I mean, I have the, here we go. I have the postcard stamp already on this one because this is the one that you have your friends sign and come back um, to, uh, to us. And when they sign, they become a petition signer. And so then you, what you do is you close it up and 
write their address here and your personal note there. And, you know, this has been working really well. We have had um, more than a thousand re returned to us. Um, and it's, we're, we're topping 25% response. And soon we'll be sending them, taking them all, we're gathering them all up uh, and going to the Senate to say, look, here's how much information, how much, how many different people all over the country want uh, statehood for DC. So that would be one thing you could do. I have some more of these. <laughs> I'll be happy to send them to you. Uh, I so would anyway. certainly like some, but I wouldn't expect you to have to pay for them. I mean, I'm more than happy to contribute to their cost. Well, that's fabulous. Thank you. Be happy to, to take any donations. That's great. Um, and, you know, what, you, what we're re recommending is that you put a postcard stamp on the one you want to have returned so there's no barrier. And then you put your first class stamp there because since it's two postcards, it costs <clears throat> a first grant, a first class stamp. So um, I have a question with regard to the Senate vote. Would it be a simple majority or would it have to be 60 votes? Well, of course, that depends on the Senate, what right. they decide. Um, I can tell you that the 37 states that have been introduced or, and have been admitted to this to the union since the first 13 have all been admitted on a simple majority vote. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I see Walter's hand is up. Yeah, I, I still am puzzled. I, I have a question about the National Guard issue. Yes. In the sense that, yeah, I understand that they'd be able to call in the National Guard for the surrounding state area, but the federal area would still be under control of the U.S. government and all of the violence that occurred during the January 6th uh, riot was within what would be the federal district. So I, I, I guess I'm still puzzled as to how making it a state would have affected that in any way, shape or form. Ah, that's a really good question because like I mentioned in the video, we wouldn't have been able, the National Guard would not have been able to enter the federal uh, territory without federal permission, because that's, yeah. that's how it is. You know? But what's really amazing is that there was thousands of people that were um, assaulting the Capitol. Most of them just walked away. Nobody, nobody arrested them. Nobody stopped them. Nobody checked to see you know, how many weapons they had on them, um, nothing. And which is why the FBI is now having to put up tons and tons of pictures saying, anybody know who this is? Because, you know, what, and that's why I'm saying, if the National Guard had been able to be called out and had been able to surround the Capitol area, okay, no, they would not have been able to go on the grounds, but neither would anybody have been able to leave willy-nilly the way they just walked off. Uh, they would have had people saying, oh, here you are. Look at this. You've been on the Capitol grounds, and it looks to me like we need to hold you in custody until we figure out whether this is something that uh, shouldn't have been happening. And so I think it would have been a whole lot easier to figure out who was doing what and what they had. I mean, there's still people today. I saw something saying that there were groups who had stashed weapons. Um, so it's very difficult. Um, I just think it would have. And we don't know. This is the other part, Walter. We don't know what it would have been like to suddenly have you know, several thousand real seasoned troops there. You know, I wonder how the whole thing would have changed, whether people would have said, oh, I guess I'll go home now. This looks like it's getting over my head instead of people milling around and deciding to go ahead and dash in and 
wander around the Capitol and take selfies. So that's how I'm thinking about it. But it's really true that it's it's a mess. Um, and um, yeah, so that's it's it's the delay that would have been different, I think, um, other than that. So one of the things I would like to do is to share my screen. Um, so unless there's something specific about the video, I think it'd be better to go ahead and talk a little bit more about statehood in general. And then, you know, so that I'm not saying, well, that's, you know, that's on my next slide. <laughs> so, so Jennifer, was there something about the video? You're muted. You're probably going to cover this, in which case, delay. I'm just curious as to why anyone would object to you being a state. Oh, I will definitely cover that. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So let me share my screen here if I can. All right, so now here we go. <clears throat> so that's just the first part here. But, you know, let me just talk about why we're doing this presentation. You know, well, history was made last year. And like I say, it was made again just this morning because it once again got voted out of committee. Um, but it was really especially poignant last year um, because we celebrate the centennials of the US League of Women Voters, the 19th Amendment, the DC League was 100 years last year. We, by the way, we called them uh, ourselves the Voteless League of Women Voters when they were founded. So it was wonderful to see HR 51 pass the House last year. And so we've been working for several years to educate leaguers around the country and our survey of the, uh, of the League last year um, you know, just find out how we were doing. We found out that a lot of people knew a lot more, but there were still some things that people were confused about. So here's what we wanna do. Um, we wanna be able to identify some historical background, how the lack of statehood affects DC, and, you know, talk about how to help, which we've already said a little bit about. So here's a quick question. Um, you can put this, put a note uh, what, your, what your answer is in the chat, or you can just keep it to yourself, whichever you like. But, you know, when did D.C. lose congressional representation? Did we ever have it? Was it when the Virginia side went back to Virginia? Was it in 1801? Was it in 1789 when the Constitution was adopted? You know, what do you think? Well, it's like, mm. so. I'm giving you a couple seconds here and then I'll move on and see what we did. All right, so we lost congressional representation in 1801. So at that point, you know, there were US citizens living in DC, many of whom had fought in the Revolutionary War and they were still able to vote in Maryland and in Virginia. Uh, for, for Congress, for the president during the 10 years after DC had been established. And then Congress moved into DC in 1801 and passed the Organic Act that immediately disenfranchised everybody living in DC from one day to the next. So congressional records show that even back then they were concerned about, and this is a quote, turning DC citizens into subjects so the idea that the founding fathers wanted it this way isn't true. They were already concerned about what was happening. So just to make everything collapsed uh, historically, there were just many, many arrangements tried over the years. Um, but no matter what, Congress continued to exercise total control over DC as is required by the constitution. Um, they even changed the size by retroceding the Virginia area back to Virginia just before the Civil War. And they even established 
a territorial government in the 70s, 1870s. When it, but when it became clear there would be many African Americans elected in DC, among other reasons, Congress changed the arrangement to a presidentially appointed commission, which was sort of a dictatorial arrangement that lasted for nearly a hundred years. So now we're jumping to more recent, uh, the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and that's where I, you know, I came to DC in 64. Um, and so that was the first time with the 23rd Amendment that we were able to vote for president. And then we had a non-voting delegate to Congress. And then we, by 73, we had limited home rule. Um, so let's take a look at how that works. So here's how we are on the left-hand side of your screen. We have the DC map showing the eight wards. And alongside is a map of the new state with the federal district boundaries. So our eight wards elect representatives to the DC council along with five at large members. And our mayor functions like a governor with many state and county functions as well as normal municipal tasks. The council passes legislation, the mayor signs it and it becomes law unless Congress disapproves during their review and they have a review period that's measured in legislative days. Uh, so, you know, it could be 30 days or it could end up being months. Our judges are appointed by the president. So with no voting representation, Congress and not even a voice in the Senate were cut out of any decision-making at the national level. So the map on the right-hand side shows the federal district. It's a little white part. By the way, the boundaries are pretty close to the security zone that was established after the insurrection. The capital city that people think of is all going to be in, encompassed in the new federal district, the national government buildings, the monuments, the mall, the monumental core of the district. So with the federal district still present, we're constitutional because the constitution says there shall be a federal district not to exceed 10 miles square. And Congress has already reduced its size before the civil war. So the territory where 712,000 people live will be in the new state. And we know we can become a state by a simple majority vote as I'm already mentioned. So here's some just, you know, we don't have to, enough time to explore all the effects of being a colony of the Congress, but here's some things that stand out. During the years that Congress prevented our needle exchange program, we ended up with the highest HIV AIDS infection in the nation, an infection rate, you know, um, because Congress also has control of our local tax dollars, not just the federal dollars. They prevented us from using them to help low-income women. Um, Congress usually treats DC as if it were a state when distributing block grants like Medicaid, you know, I mean, usually over 500 times in a congressional session, it says, and this shall happen in the 50 states and Washington, DC. But this time they went out of their way to name us as a territory in the COVID relief bill last year. And it shorted us by $750 million. So the current bill in the House that passed made DC whole, and now it's sitting in the Senate. Um, and then of course, as I've already mentioned, on January 6th, she could have called out, the mayor could have called out the National Guard. So no, I'm taught, I mentioned that many policies imposed on DC are discriminatory. Now for the record, the racism that's displayed is often not subtle. It ranges from microaggressions to intended insults. Um, for instance, in 1967, when our newly appointed mayor commissioner, Walter Washington, he was appointed, that was our first uh, move and um, President Lyndon Johnson uh, 
appointed him and changed it from the three commissioner state. When he submitted his first budget to the House District Committee, Chairman John McMillan responded by sending a truckload of watermelons to his office. So I, I'm not saying anything more about that. Um, so we've tried many ways to get full rights for DC citizens and it's become clear that in order to be on an equal footing with the rest of the country, the residential and commercial parts of DC need to be admitted as a state. So let's look at our progress. Well, this is, you know, looking at the, you know, how it's been growing, how our momentum has been accelerating. And as I've said, we've, we've now got it out of the oversight committee and it'll be on, going to the floor next week and it'll probably pass. So uh, this, slide is a little outdated because I did it like two weeks ago. And so it's already out of date. Um, but here's, you know, people are often like, well, wait, you know, what are we doing here? Well, Congress is the one that admits new states into the union. These are all, this is all taken from the constitution. State boundaries can't be changed without the consent of the state. That's an important, because people are asking, well, why not just go back to Maryland? You know, well, Maryland would have to agree to that change of boundaries. And most of the Maryland congressional delegation are co-sponsors the Washington DC Admission Act, which is pretty clear that they're, they don't want us. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in local control, DC citizens voted to become a state. Uh, so, you know, as, a, as I mentioned, all but the original 13 were admitted by a majority vote of Congress. So here's a question for you that I could really use your help with. You know, what do your friends and neighbors say about DC statehood? So could you just type a few words into the chat? Because this, you know, we're, we're, we sit in DC, so we're... <laughs> We're not sure what it's like, you know, what, how are we seeing out there? And this would help us contextualize our conversation for a diverse audience. Um, so if you could just give us a few lines, like, you know, what are they saying? How do, how do they see DC? Uh, what kinds of comments do you hear about DC statehood if you hear anything? I'll give you a couple, couple minutes and I would love to pick those up later. Um, okay, I can see that some people have, have responded. Thank you. Uh, so let's move on. And, you know, if you have some other ideas, just continue to put them in. So here's some common questions. So is it constitutional? Well, yes, because it's, you know, there's still a federal district and Congress will still have complete control as man mandated by the constitution. Does it need a constitutional amendment? No, all the states have been admitted by majority vote. So partisanship, ah, let me say a few words about the partisan issue because of course the league is avowedly nonpartisan and I'm often asked, well, how can you be you know, working for DC statehood because it's, you know, are you being partisan? Well, the league has been working for full rights for DC citizens since 1938. So count them, Democrats, Republicans, name it, you name it, we've been working for full rights. And so it's, you know, we understand that it's the lack of representation and local self-government that are civil rights and human rights issues. So then there's also the issue of remembering Alaska and Hawaii who were brought in supposedly to balance each other with Alaska leaning Democrat and Hawaii leaning Republican and now they've switched. So while of course, to if we became a state tomorrow, DC citizens would vote for Democrat because that's how things are set up right now. Um, but who knows? how citizens will vote over the long run when they live in a state. 
And by the way, to object to people having full representation in our national legislature because of how they might vote is sheer unadulterated partisan voter suppression. So that's what we've been working on. So why hasn't statehood passed already? Well, I think there's a practical politics issue to begin with. DC residents are not constituents. So if you think about going to a candidate forum in your part of the world and your congressional candidate stands up and says, I'm for DC statehood. Well, your first question is going to be, what does that have to do with me? And what about what you're trying to do for me? So it's going to be hard unless constituents say to candidates, hey, I'm concerned about the way we're treating our nation's capital. And then they'll say, well, I guess I have to figure out what to do about that. But not the other way around. Spending time on DC would seem unproductive to them in terms of getting reelected. So then let's talk about race. Um, the Democrats held sway for more than half of the 20th century. And we have to think in terms of Dixiecrats. Uh, so, you know, racism had an ugly influence. And so, you know, we have a problem. And we're still a majority minority district. And, you know, we can go to plenty of, of evidence about the way that race is. And by the way, if, he, if anybody hasn't read yet uh, Chocolate City, that would be a really important book to see. It's by Christopher Myers Ash and uh, Derek, oh man, I'm, I'm a little blitzed here. Um, anyway, it's Chocolate City. Um, so um, then of course, there's the, the thing we've already said that uh, people are just blatantly saying, well, you're, you know, it's a power grab. But I wanna say, I mean, I've lived here for a long time and I've watched both parties make DC, they use DC to make points at home. You know, like, well, we, we protected fill in the blank by not letting DC do this or by making DC do this. And so, you know, we're used as a Petri dish often. So this is not a useful thing to do to people. So we're moving here. What can you do to help? Well, you can pass a resolution supporting statehood and we have draft resolutions that any organization can use. You can sign the statehood petition. It's on the National uh, League website or you can just go to us and we'll zip you there. You can talk to your friends and neighbors and relatives about DC statehood. I'm serious, paying attention and saying, you know what? I really think we have to do something about this. We'll really help. Um, you can share our DC State of Toolcoat, which is on our website, and you can invite us. We, I have, it's not just me. I have a team of people who have been trained to give this presentation. So if you have a church social justice group or a Y that wants to, you know, hear something about it, please give us a call. And so there's my email, statehood at lwbdc.org. And that's me, Ann Anderson. So you right there and you will, you will get me. So, all right. So now, of course, we need a little feedback. Um, can you please rank your learning outcomes from one to five in the chat? You know, can you know something about the historical situation? Can you talk about the major impacts? Can you list several concrete actions to help DC gain statehood? You know, can you just put a, a little one to five in your in the chat? And um, you know, one is not very much and five is a lot. So just to be clear about that. And let me show you. This last state 
um, that this is from the mayor's office. And I thought it was a really useful one because it shows you what some of the things would be in the federal enclave. And then of course, some of the things that would remain in the state, the new state. So, so thank you. And shall I stop sharing my screen so we can see each other? Sure. Okay. There we go. That was fascinating, Ann. Well, good. I'm glad. I, I personally learned a lot of information that I didn't know. I had no idea that DC initially had rights. <laughs> I didn't realize that it wasn't until later that it was. Yeah, it wasn't until, DC, until the Congress moved in. I see Linda has a question. Yes. And you're muted. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I agree, Wendy. I learned more in this Zoom session that I've learned in the last 20 Zoom lessons, you know, that I've paid, <laughs> that I've attended. So um, this was really fascinating to me. And I too was a little uncertain if it was a constitutional issue or not. And I didn't realize that. So that was good to know. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, Anne, if you um, have any sense of the feeling from the leagues who are in more red districts. Well, um, we've given presentations, uh, like I say, in 30 states. Um, and um, most, I mean, it, it could be that the people who come to our presentations are ones that are more interested in, you know, mm -hmm. supporting us or not, you can't tell. Um, yeah. But I've also had people say, well, my goodness, you know, why in the world would we, you know, want you to be a state? It's, I mean, I've heard things about it being too small. Well, that was already decided mm -hmm. in the constitution when it was established, you know, mm -hmm. the big, big state, small state two senators to every state, that kind of thing. And by the way, you know, we, we don't enfranchise land, we enfranchise <laughs> people. So, and we have more people than two states and we're on par with seven. So, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't compute in fact. Um, but there are concerns that people have and um, I think what I've seen happen uh, is trying to figure out how you, how you even, I mean, the, part of it is like worrying about not having a capital. I mean, <clears throat> I've heard that. Um, <laughs> Because if you're going to be a state, then how can, you know, and that's a, that's a lot of what the opposition does is they say, well, it's got to be constitutional because D.C. is, you know, and they don't point, they don't make it clear the way this bill is written, which is that we still maintain a federal district. We just, it's just reduced. So I think there's a lot of misinformation out there and when we actually describe uh, what goes on, then people are like, oh, I get it. I mean, I've had, I've put up big maps, you know, big maps. And uh, even at these, at the, at the council meeting, the legislative council or the league council meeting, uh, we, we had a, a reception where we put up big maps because it was in DC, just outside of DC and, um, and, you know, the, the council delegates would come up and then they'd look at the map and then, you know, like you could see the light dawn, like, oh, that's how it would work. So, you know, we got so many things going on and it doesn't really hit you personally. So I think 
I'm just really reluctant to let it go by and say, well, red states. No, no, no. I think it's people who don't understand. Mm -hmm. And that's where I would go first. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, well, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. and I, you know, it, the arguments are all very convincing to those of us who are focused on these issues, okay? <laughs> but when it boils down to pure politics, particularly in the Senate, and given the fact that a filibuster would be very likely, how do you, how do you convince 10 Republican senators in order to go ahead and vote for this? I don't know. I don't know how you do that. Um, I mean, it seems to me that if we are stuck with the filibuster that we will not get statehood this year. Um, so that's how I'm, I'm what, seeing it. What is the overall league position on the filibuster? I'm, I'm not, not informed on that. Well, I actually asked about that a couple months ago, as you could well imagine. Um, and actually, Virginia Case just put out a big um, blog post on the filibuster. And basically what they're calling for is um, a, uh, a fixing it, uh, adjusting it, making it, you know, making it, bringing it more into line with what it's supposed to be, which is protecting the minority and giving the Senate enough time to think through instead of being railroaded by the majority. Right now, the way it is, the way the Senate, the way the filibuster works right now is all you have to say is, well, you got to have 60 votes and I won't vote for cloture because that's all that they have to do. And then the opposition gets to go home and the, the majority has to sit there. And so it's really become, um, it's become misused. Uh, and so basically what they're talking about, I think, um, although they haven't been specific, or like Virginia case wasn't specific, um, was you know that it become more uh, like it used to be where you had to be here. You had to, mm -hmm. act, if you wanted to have a, a filibuster, you had to come and talk. If you wanted to object to something, you had to come and talk about why you objected. Um, so I think a talking filibuster would be a different way of doing it, but that does, still doesn't mean that we would necessarily get statehood passed. Sure. So, hey, what, what, one additional one, and then I'll be quiet. Uh, do you see any problem with the 23rd Amendment as part of this? No, and here's why, um, because um, the way the bill is written, it's, uh, let's see, because I heard this this morning uh, in the uh, oversight committee, there was a big long discussion about it and Jamie Raskin explained it about 20 times. So let me see <laughs> if I can explain it. Maybe, probably not as well as he could. Um, there's a provision in the bill, the HR 51, that says the 23rd Amendment has a, um, a constitutional or a congressional mandate in it that says the con Congress shall say how this, these three electoral votes that belong to the federal district will be dealt with. So what the bill does is it uh, basically nullifies that thing so that there wouldn't be any way to use those three, con con uh, con the, those three electoral votes. Uh, and then what would be the best thing, the clearest thing would be for it to be, um, you know, taken out and for it to be uh, repealed, which would, which would mean that you'd need to have the state um, legislatures repeal them, just like anything, any change in the constitution. Mm. But, but the effective process of you know does then the do the then the three people that live in the white house because really there is nobody who lives in the new federal district i mean there's i mean there might be somebody 
some homeless person sitting on some street side, but there's nobody with a permanent residence except the White House. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there would be nobody there to actually make this happen. And those people would be, uh, I mean, Biden's right now are registered in Delaware. So I'd hope, I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, Evelyn, you're muted. There. Um, obviously, you've been fighting for statehood for a long, long time. But I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little on what advantages statehood gives DC residents over just if they had become part of Maryland. And by becoming part of Maryland, they would have had all the, the same rep representation and everything but they wouldn't have had the additional political hurdle of the Republicans not wanting to give a democratic city to senators. Mm -hmm. so why did they originally opt to go for statehood as opposed to becoming part of Maryland? Well, that's another good question. And you know, one of the ways I answer that um, is always, yes, rejoining Maryland, because that's where the land originally came from is another option to gaining our full representation. Absolutely. The problems with that are, first of all, Maryland would have to agree to that. Um, we have 712,000 people. Most of them are progressive at this point. Um, and I think Maryland has taken a look at that and said, Perhaps if we took back DC, Western Maryland would secede, you know? So, <laughs> I mean, the, the fruit basket turnover of political issues that Maryland would then have to deal with. Never mind that DC has a huge difficulty with homelessness and poverty. I mean, we have our own social issues that need to be dealt with by the people who live in DC. Then the second thing is that we have actually been DC now for 220 years. And that's a long time to have to figure out how then to go back and join somebody else, which is, although we have plenty of mutual interests, uh, it's just a, a very difficult thing to think about. Um, and, you know, it, in addition, that's not what DC citizens voted for. So, well, if, if I may expand on that, just, sure. to, um, you have residential areas, you, you have some commercial areas, but does it, DC have enough of an economic base to make it as a state um, on their own. Absolutely. We, we have been, in fact, you know, sometimes I say, you know, actually DC is supporting the federal government mm -hmm. because what happens if, I mean, every year, well, during COVID, no, <laughs> but assuming a normal time every week, we um, expand our population from 712,000 to over a million. And all of those people come in from Maryland and Virginia and work in DC. And we in DC pay street, lights, water, you know, you name it, police, police. Um, all of those things that are, you know, used by people coming in from all around. So mm -hmm. we, you know, uh, that's part of why I say, yeah, you know, and, and there have been times when the government, the federal government was shut down and DC picked up the trash for the federal government. So that's another one of those interesting little items. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but they, but the piece that I think is, um, is more, where was I going? <laughs> um, the, um, the piece that I'm trying to put together here um, for, when people move, to, when people live in one place and work in another, the normal way to do that is that you tax people where they work. Mm -hmm. Right now, people are taxed where they live. If you live in Maryland and you work in DC, Maryland gets to take the taxes. Virginia gets to take the taxes. So there are no taxes that DC can uh, get from people who work in DC. Um, so if, if we become a state, number one, those kinds of things would immediately get shifted. And it's really amazing because for the longest time, uh, Maryland and Virginia people were against DC getting being a state because they were worried about commuter taxes and so on. And I think what they finally figured out is that this would be better all around if there was somebody in, instead of being the hole in the middle of the donut, if there was actually a functioning um, system, a state, a third state with DC, Maryland and Virginia, um, that that would be better in the long run for them. So that's, that's one thing. One of the, th just in terms of um, the critical issues, um, DC was in the nineties, well, the judicial system was taken away from DC. And, and so that all of our prisoners are now spread out all over the countryside um, in the 50 states, they're probably six, to 8,000 people, I think, who are, who, because our judicial system is entirely, entirely federalized. So one of the things we would have to do would be to reclaim all of that. So that would be a, a good chunk of change to make that happen. But all of the uh, economies, the economists that talk about how DC is going is, you know, we have this triple A bond rating. We've been, uh, you know, with budget surpluses for 20 years. Um, and there's still a bunch of issues. I mean, we still have to, you know, if you get down to the weeds in DC, well, we're talking affordable housing and, you know, <laughs> fixing lead pipes and all of those kinds of things. And um, making sure that we take care of our people. Um, but I think that it would work uh, pretty clearly we can do this. And by the way, we do not take more than about 25% of our budget from the federal government. And those budget items are things like Medicaid or uh, transportate, you know, street money, those kinds of things. Um, and that's about, we're, I think there are eight states that are either on par or take more. I think Mississippi is like 35% of their, of their um, state budget comes from federal funds, so. Jennifer, you had a question? So if you become a state, you get two state senators. We understand that. Um, I'm embarrassed to ask this, but give me a civics lesson. What happens about representatives? Do they add the number or do you take representatives from some other state? Ooh, nice job, Jennifer. <laughs> this, one, this one is a really critical one. And I think it, and when people really start looking at it, I think that Congress is probably gonna have to do something about this. They, um, Congress, and I think in 19, uh, don't quote me, but something like 17 or 13 or 11, 19, 11, one of those times, they set the total amount, number of, 
of representatives at 435. Oh. So ever since then, we've had to, to, you know, whatever, 435, we have to reapportion with 435. That's it, that's it. And so guess what? A representative that started off, you know, maybe 500,000 people, I don't, has now 2 million. I don't even know how many. Do you guys know how many people uh, one of your representatives represents? You know? So it's I ridiculous. Know I mean, gonna have a quiz. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so yes. You know, it would if if it if that cap stays, then yeah, we'd have to figure out 430 under 435. I think that's nuts, but you know, who's asking me? You know, <laughs> but I think it would be make more sense to increase the number of representatives. Yeah. Um, so. The reason I was asking is I'm still trying to figure out more reasons why this hasn't been approved. And I thought, well, maybe it's because some state thinks they're going to lose representatives somehow. I think you're right. I think that's perfectly possible. If, if they have even gotten to that, okay, let's see, how are we going to incorporate another state? You know, up till then, it'd been like, I can't tell you how many times in my life I've been told, why are we even doing this? You know, who, nobody's gonna, DC is never gonna become a state. So why are you even bothering, you know? And my question is, what else do you want me to do? You know, because I would like to be represented and this is where I live. And so, you know, but I think you're right. You know, when you really start looking at the power questions, then it becomes much trickier. And yeah, yeah. I think there's also issues like uh, people are talking about, you know, the racial equality, the racial justice questions. I think people are also talking about the urban rural split, you know, that if DC became a state, clearly it would be an urban state, you know? And we've actually been accused of like, why would, could you even be a state? Cause you don't have any cows. Well, actually we, there are, some cows, you know. but you know, cows don't vote. So excuse me. So. Go ahead, Linda. Um, yeah. Hi. And I have a question and maybe I missed this when you, when you said it, cause I was writing stuff down. So I may have missed it, but um, in 1911, 13, 17, whenever it was <laughs> that the cap was set at 435. How was that cap set? Who set that? Congress. Congress set that by, 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 um, but I mean, I just a vote. They, they can unset it. <laughs> Let's oh, yes. It. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's not part okay. of the constitution. It's just a congressional rule. Icon. And I have one more question, just as a matter of curiosity, because it just occurred to me. Who issues like driver's license, like in Illinois, of course, the state issues an Illinois driver's license and also like an, a state ID. Now, who would who issues that in in D.C.? We do. There is a D.C. I have a D.C. driver's license. OK. And it, OK. In, in fact, so it's what been, agency, what agency in DC does that? I mean, if, if the DC... Department of Transportation, we have oh, a DOT, okay. we have, yeah, we have an electoral, I mean, we function as a state and a county and a municipality. Oh, okay. I got you. Thanks. I got you. We have a Department of Education because we okay. have schools. We have gotcha. a Department of Parks and Recreation because we have parks and recreations and swimming pools and you know. okay makes sense but Thanks. I love I love those questions because <laughs> you're trying to figure out what is this animal that is <laughs> in that's called DC mm -hmm. and where people live you know mm -hmm. like, oh. so so you mentioned before so so if you commit a crime in DC you it's a federal crime? Yes. Wow. So yeah. even, 
Yeah, there there are a few misdemeanor kinds of things that uh you know that are civil sort of things and then they they don't go. But if you be if you actually commit a felony, you are immediately in the federal system. And it makes it extremely difficult uh for prisoners and of course, you know, we won't get into it, but you know, most we have a huge proportion of black and brown prisoners, and then they get sent to Oregon or Illinois or you know New York or Texas or wherever where there's a place, and then of course it's really hard for their families to be in touch with them, and you know, and then you try to get them back, and reintegration. It's very difficult. Plus, we just. This last year, we um, were we passed a law that says yes, incarcerated people can vote, and then talk about trying to figure out. The league was very involved in this, trying to figure out how to get voter registration cards to our prisoners, and we were at the mercy of wardens all over the country, trying to get them to deliver appropriate voter registration. So yeah, it's big. It's a big deal. And we can't wait to be able to bring our people back. So well, there was so much I learned tonight that I had no idea about. Did anybody else have any other questions? No, but thank you, Anne. I learned a lot. <laughs> Well, I'm delighted to have a chance to talk. This is really, really great. Um, and like I say, if anybody wants one of these or 10 of these, I send them out in packets of 10. <laughs> Wendy, were you able to record this so that we can share it with other people, this presentation? Yeah, it's, it's live streaming on our YouTube channel right now. Oh, okay, good. And so it'll be saved there as soon as we close out. All right, good. Cool. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, I, I, I guess we can call it a night. Okay. All okay. right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Delighted. Thank you, Thank you. Questions. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for putting this together. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks again, Ann. You're welcome. And I 